Okay, today we're going to learn about the great pianist and composer Franz Liszt, and this will be part one in a series discussing his life and music. Liszt was born in 1811, and he was part of the late Romantic movement in music, in Western music, and he was a very controversial figure throughout his life. He was a great performer, kind of a rock star. Um, he attracted huge audiences. He was a very flamboyant performer, almost a show-off, you would say, um, which raised the ire of a lot of other musicians. Uh, Clara Schumann, who was also a great virtuoso pianist, uh, didn't like Liszt at all, didn't like his music at all. Um, his music, his, his, was although he was considered a great pianist, as a composer he was always controversial. Uh, to this day, the jury is still out on whether or not he was a great composer. He was a great innovator as far as his keyboard compositions. He was a huge influence on most of the composers that came after him, uh, Ravel, Bartok, many others used Liszt's innovations, were very influenced by his innovations, but he was not considered by many to be a great orchestrator or a um, great technician as far as composition went. Brahms, who was a great musical technician, uh, one of the greatest that ever, ever lived, hated Liszt's music and referred to it as swindle. Liszt was good friends with Wagner, who was also a, an innovator at the time, <coughs> although Wagner was mainly an opera composer, and uh, Brahms loved Wagner's music and often referred to himself as the greatest Wagnerian, <coughs> but could never warm up the list. Liszt was born in Hungary, and his father, Adam Liszt, always wanted to be either a musician or a priest, which was obviously a huge influence on Liszt because Liszt became a very successful musician and later in life he actually entered a monastery and had intended to become a priest but he never quite made it. He made it uh, as far, he became an abbey and that's as far as he got up the uh, ladder in the Catholic Church. <coughs> Uh, when Liszt was a small boy, his father realized he had tremendous musical talent. He was able to sight-read just about any piece that was put in front of him, much to the amazement of everyone around him. And his father worked for the uh, Esterhazy estate in Hungary. Est the Esterhazys were a wealthy family, and... The Esterhazys at one time were the patrons of uh, Franz Joseph Haydn. So, Adam took his young son to Berlin to study music and quit his job and left his wife, Anna, who was quite a bit younger than him, behind with the um, intention of training um, Franz and taking him on tours and pretty much devoting his entire life to Franz's well-being and education. When they got to Berlin, they were very poor. Um, Liszt was able to raise a little money by giving concerts, but he needed to study piano. So he studied with Carl Cherney, who agreed to uh, tutor him for free. He tutored him, tutored him for 
five weeks for a year and a half, starting when List was 14 years old. At the same time, List also took composition lessons with Salieri, the infamous Salieri, who, uh, of course, was accused of poisoning Mozart, um, which there is absolutely no evidence to prove that. It made a good movie, it made a good story, but it's, it's complete nonsense. Salieri was a very religious guy, a very charitable guy. He taught Liszt for free. He taught a lot of uh, students that didn't have the money to pay him, that had talent. He uh, tutored them for free. And he was very successful in his day as an opera composer and a court composer and a teacher. So he didn't need the money. Uh, he was never married. He was, uh, again, he was very religious. And he was probably celibate, uh, despite, again, what you see in the Amadeus movie. So he taught Liszt composition. And Cherney taught him piano for a year and a half. And much to Cherney's chagrin, after a year and a half, Adam took Franz on a tour of Europe. And he never studied piano again. But they needed money desperately at this time. So they went on a tour, and they were able to raise some money. But unfortunately, sometime during this tour, Adam died. And Liszt was left alone at a young age to fend for himself. And he managed for a while by giving piano lessons and uh, perhaps performing a little bit. But he was really uh, in dire straits for quite a while. And he met a woman who was uh, a bit older than him, Catherine de Gault who was uh, married, and she was also royalty. Now, de Gaulle fancied herself a, a writer, and basically she was a dilettante. Very educated person, but uh, List lived with her for quite a few years. As a matter of fact, uh, he had three children with Marie de Gaulle, his only three children. <clears throat> all out of wedlock. And uh, <clears throat> he lived with her for several years, and to a large degree she oppressed him, probably because she was very jealous of his tremendous talent, and kind of kept him from touring and really developing as an artist. And this went on for several years until List finally just broke away and went on an extensive tour of Europe which uh, lasted for a few years and during this time List left his children in the care of his mother who was living in Paris at this time and accumulated a huge fortune because he commanded tremendous fees for his concerts. He was, again, like a rock star. People would come and see him in droves. And after three and a half years of that, he got tired of performing in public. So when he was 35 years old, he performed his last concert and very dramatically closed the lid on the piano at the end of the concert. And that was the last time he played a public performance for money. He would play other times, but always uh, for free, for charity events, that kind of thing. And uh, <clears throat> the next phase of his life, he moved to Weimar, Germany and lived at this big mansion that was on the top of a hill overlooking the town which was called the um, the Altamont. Now he lived there for 15 years 
and he was appointed Kapellmeister of the uh, the Weimar Kapellmeister. Now, at that time, the position of Kapellmeister was not like it was in Bach's time. It wasn't a church musician. The Kapellmeister was the conductor of the uh, local orchestra. And Liszt never got a fee for being Kapellmeister, even though he was supposed to. He never really cared about money his whole life. And at this point, after he had acquired a lot, he just started giving it away. Also, while he was there, he started teaching. He taught, over his lifetime, he taught over 400 students. They were all the greatest pianists in Europe at the time. Uh, one of his students, Von Bulow, married his daughter, Cosima, his oldest daughter, uh, who later divorced Von Bulow to marry Richard Wagner which, uh, although Liszt and Wagner were great friends, there was also always some contretemps between them uh, for a lot of different reasons. Wagner was a completely insufferable human being. And Liszt was the long-suffering, overly charitable, um, later in his life, very religious and almost pious type. So he always he was always at odds with Wagner, uh, but he always maintained a relationship with him, especially after he had become his son-in-law. Uh, son-in-law Wagner was only a few years uh, younger than him. Younger than him, Cosimo was much younger than Wagner. But Liszt had over four hundred students, and those students had massive amounts of students, and they had students. So there, to this day, there is a list school of teachers. Um, my piano teacher, Norma Verrilli, who I was uh, fortunate enough to study with for a few years, was a student of a student of a student of a student of Liszt. And she passed along a lot of information verbally that goes back to that tradition. A lot of music history that was passed on to her verbally by these teachers over the years. And a lot of insight to how classical music is performed. A lot of it is oral tradition. And it actually goes back further than Liszt. It would go back to Bach. But because of this Liszt school, which still exists today, there are thousands, tens of thousands of uh, teachers, the pianists all over the world that come out of that school. Even uh, the great jazz pianist Oscar Peterson studied with a one of Liszt's students, students, students. And so this great technique and all this musical knowledge has been passed down by oral tradition. So Liszt had... Uh, 400 students. He taught three days a week when he was at the Altamont. And it was basically a master class that he would give where students would come up. They had a, they were already advanced students. We'd play a piece and they'd play for a while and Liszt would basically come up and push them off the piano and say this is how it's done. And uh, demonstrate how he thought the piece should be played. And it also during this time, Liszt started uh, composing seriously. He had composed before, but now he had a lot more time to compose. And he was always plagued by the, sent the uh, general sentiment that he was not accepted as a composer. Everybody thought he was a great pianist, but never took his... Uh, composition seriously. And ironically, he's a, a very famous composer today. Um, there's uh, His music's been used in movies, and there's even a Bugs Bunny cartoon where Bugs Bunny plays the second Hungarian Rhapsody of Liszt, so, which is probably Liszt's most famous piece, and I, I've also seen that featured in other cartoons. 
So this music has become very famous, despite the fact that uh, critics and scholars and other people who never seem to know what they're talking about <laughs> uh, have never really fully accepted West. So, at, when List lived at the Altamont, he lived with his second mistress, who was also royalty and also married, Catherine von Wittgenstein. Now, he lived with her for 15 years, and she finally got a divorce, which was very difficult to do at that time just about the time List had turned 50. And instead of marrying her, List basically ran away and joined a monastery in Rome. And that brings us to the last phase of List's life. And this is a very thumbnail explanation a very thumbnail, very short biography of List's life. There's a three-volume tome of uh, List's life, which I'm going to make a link available to down below. Okay, thanks for listening. We'll do part two of this at some point in the future. Have a great day.